episode of Seedling Stitch Knitting Podcast. I'm your host Athena, and I'm a new knitter since last year September. So I'm about an eight eight month old knitter, and I'm calling this podcast Seedling Stitch because I want to grow as a knitter with you by doing this program. Um, I'm coming to you from Vancouver, Canada. Where I'm doing my PhD in mechanical engineering, and it's my last year. And I'm doing this knitting podcast because, for one thing, I find knitting is relaxing, and there's so many interesting things I want to share with you. And for another, I think it's a, uh, it's just a mentally good thing for me. Last week there was one day where I was super stressed due to some research stuff、uh, at school, and I literally spent a couple minutes just look at my YouTube comments, coming from all of you, all the nice comments, to feel a bit better, and then I can go back to my research, go back to my PhD and stuff. So yeah, so I wholeheartedly. I'm thankful to all of your nice comments,、uh, and if you are new, welcome. And there's a few features of my podcast that、uh, I like to tell you first. So、uh, the first is that I'm a huge fan of Japanese knitting books and the Japanese knitting patterns and designs. So in my、uh, in my podcast, I tend to share a lot of、uh, Japanese knitting content. And also last week, I just made、uh, my first Japanese knitting tutorial.、Uh, I call it the Japanese knitting mini lesson series, where I、uh, give you a small walkthrough of a Japanese、uh, knitting pattern, and I walk you through how to read the Japanese、uh, schematics and the chart, so that even if you don't understand Japanese at all, you will able you will be able to. Uh, use some Japanese knitting patterns, and there's a lot of nice designs, and a lot of free patterns. And I actually introduce you to one of the free Japanese pattern website. So if you're interested, feel free to check it out. And today we're also going to talk about some Japanese knitting content.、Uh, secondly, uh, I'm a I'm a new knitter, and I also like to share a lot of techniques. So I think. Uh, I have an advantage in that I I'm new and I still remember the pain, maybe not the pain, the joy of learning something new from scratch. And when I'm sharing some new techniques, maybe I could be better at explaining some things for a complete beginner. And if you are also a beginner knitter,、uh, I just hope some of the adventure. That I share with you will be、uh, a little bit more approachable. And the third feature of my podcast is that I think because of because I'm an engineer and I've been doing research stuff for a super long life, super long time, and have been in school. I'm just sort of engineering and science trained, and it means that my approach to knitting can be a bit different and. The way that I think about some constructions in knitting,、uh, just n- there might be something、uh, different here. And today our topic is socks, as you have seen in the topic bar.、Uh, a, f- a few weeks ago, I have received some comments from viewers. They asked me、uh, if I have done any socks and if I could share them. Uh, the answer is yes. I have、uh, made three. No, I have made two pairs of socks. The first pair I made was the Sunday socks by Bedit Knit, and the second pair of socks was also a Bedit Knit、uh, design. This ruffle sock, and I have gifted this to、uh, my parents, and it's in the mail. From here to China,、uh, so I cannot <laughs> share the real thing. Perhaps I'll put a picture here. And、um, right now, I'm in the process of designing my own sock. This is a seedling sock, and 
uh, yeah, that's my third pair, and I'm only going through one of the sock. And for the second, I'm uh, making some tutorials as well as uh, as well as knitting the socks. But uh, instead of doing this traditional knitting podcast style, instead of just walking you through each of these projects, I want to do this a little bit differently because uh, I, I didn't do a sock episode before because I wasn't confident about my sock knitting techniques. I could follow a pattern and make one sock at that point, but I just didn't really understand what I have done to to shape this sock. It just feels like magic to me and I just didn't know why following the pattern I could make a sock, how, how that could work. And there are so many different aspects of socks and so many different constructions and I understand that for a lot of beginner knitter, the sock knitting could be a little bit overwhelming so many different choices, so many different techniques, and it can be a little bit scary and you don't know how to start. And I'm here to help you today. (laughs) I have prepared a whole uh, episode with a lot of blackboard explanations and even some origami to show you how socks are done. So uh, to understand how socks works, I try to find a few socks books to give me an overview. Um, There is one very famous socks book, The 52 Weeks of Socks. I believe a lot of uh, podcasters have shared this. And this is a really good book, but I don't think it's good for a beginner socks knitter. There are 52 uh, different socks patterns with like lazy pattern or there's like color work color work patterns with charts and diagrams but uh, it's 52 socks but I I just feel what I want to learn is not 52 socks is it's not 100 socks I want to learn the formula for socks that can work for every sock so that when I can construct a sock, I know where to start if if that's <laughs> if that makes sense to you. And for that, I found another socks book. And as you have guessed, I got a Japanese socks knitting book. Well, these are in Chinese, but I always buy the Chinese translation for some original Japanese knitting books. Um, This is sock knitting using uh, the number, the size one knitting needle um, by Japan Vogue Xia. I have talked about the Japan Vogue publishing house uh, in my previous episodes. They are a Japanese publisher who uh, f- who features a lot of uh, knitting designs, knitting patterns, and this is just one of their books that talks about uh, socks. And the thing I love about this book is not like any specific pattern. So all these socks are somewhat basic, or well, there are a few like lazy pattern socks that seems complicated. There's the Fair L socks and the very fancy lacy pattern socks. But what I like about this book is that it teaches you how the socks are constructed. So they have this chart teaching you all the different constructions of like top down, toe up, afterthought heel. And then they also have a nice table telling you how many different constructions for a toe there are and all the constructions for a heel. And they also have some some nice schematics or some cartoons showing you how to do some specific technique like how to cast on for uh, toe up socks. So my 
uh, episode today is kind of based on this book. So I have spent one week or two weeks just studying this book. And also they have this knitting, these knitting patterns, knitting charts that have been really helpful for me to understand how things work. So I'm going to base my episode today on what I have learned from this book. And you can consider this episode just as a, a reading notes of this book. And when I'm talking about the different constructions, I will insert my projects and I will point out the different aspects of the socks that I, um, that I knitted. So I'm gonna grab my <laughs> whiteboard for teaching. <laughs> so this is a sock. And first let's learn the anatomy of socks. To make a sock, there are different parts. And on the top, we have this part that's called the cuff. And then to turn the shape, we have this part called the heel, where our heel of the foot will be wrapped around this part. And then after the turn, this part is the gosset uh, to hold your uh, your, your front part of the foot. And then at the tip, we call that the toe to wrap around the toe of your foot. So generally, a sock needs to have these four parts. And to make a sock, there are different constructions and the different construction just based on how you, uh, what is the order of uh, you knitting these four parts. And there are, in general, three different construction methods. The first one we call that the top-down or top-cuff-down construction, where the order is one, two, three, four. So you knit from top, cuff, and then you do uh, some special method for the heel. And then you do something for the gosset, and then you finish with the toe. And that is like the most basic, easiest method, usually. And this book recommends beginners to try this method first. And then there is the toe up method, where you knit one, two, three, four. So you will start with the toe and you work up to the gosset and you do something for the heel and you go to the cuff. That's the toe up method. And then there's also the afterthought. Oh, sorry, the character was erased, but this is afterthought heel. And there are two possibilities for this. And either way, you will end up doing the heel last. So you can start with the toe, do the gosset and do the cuff. So you just do like a tube shape or a cylinder shape. And then uh, while you are knitting between the gosset and cuff, you leave a yarn tip around there. And then after, after you finish the 431, you will unpick the yarn at the heel part and then you knit the heel. Or you can start with the cuff and leave a yarn, leave some waist yarn for the heel opening and then you do the gosset, and then you do the toe, and finally you unpick the leftover yarn at the heel opening and finish with the heel. So that is the afterthought construction. And for each of these constructions, there are a few uh, difficult points. And the most difficult points is the heel, because for the cuff, that is just uh, knitting in the round with a tube shape, so nothing difficult there. And for the gosset, uh, most of it is just knitting in the round, but there is a, a part that with some decrease, we usually call that the gosset decrease. So there, there might be a few difficulties at the gosset decrease, and then uh, there might be a few different methods for knitting the toe, but the most different part, a uh, difficult part, will be the heel. 
So I'm going to walk you through each of these construction methods and talk to you about how the construction of the heel, gosset, and the toe uh, can be done for each of the constructions. So let's swap to another <laughs> whiteboard. And let's talk about the top-down socks. You remember the top-down socks is knitting from the cuff to the heel to the gosset and the toe. And for the top-down socks, there are different building blocks. And for the heel, there are a few different methods. And for the toe, there are also a few different methods. And let's talk about the heel first. The easiest method for the heel construction of the top-down sock is the Dutch heel. And I actually designed my seedling sock with this method. And I'm going to show you how the Dutch heel is done by some origami. <laughs> and this is uh, the opening uh, I, I use some paper to uh, cut some shape for doing the heel. Uh, so f first you have a cuff part. I'm not sure if you can see. I think you can see. First at the cuff part, you, you are just knitting in the round. So we have this cuff part. And after you finish the cuff, you will use, you will leave half of the stitches so this half of the stitches will just be left on your needle and the rest of uh, the other half of the stitches you will knit in the flat and make a rectangle shape and that's called the heel flap. So you will, you will knit a rectangle, you will first knit a rectangle flap here and then you will knit a smaller rectangle above this uh, bigger rectangle. So you will knit this part and that is called the heel turn. And when you are knitting this smaller flap, you will use uh, the knit two together technique. Uh, it's like the decrease technique to knit the stitches around here together with the stitches around here so that when you are knitting this heel turn, these flaps, this uh, heel turn will stick with the heel uh, flap like this. So you will have like a box shape to be, oh, see, you will have a box shape to be your heel. And after that, you will do the gosset decrease where essentially you are knitting a trapezoidal shape on uh, the bottom of your uh, the bottom of the sock and the other side uh, is just knitting in the round so the gosset decrease part is knitted in the round so essentially it should be <laughs> it should be like a rounder shape but with a uh, trapezoidal shape back there and if you link everything together you will get a sock shape not sure if you can see well so you started with you started with this cuff and then you knitted a bigger he heel flap and then you knitted a smaller heel turn to uh, connect with this heel flap in a box shape and then you knit the gosset decrease in the round so essentially this gosset part and the cuff part and the, fr the tubular gosset part will be connected together and then you can just keep going to knit the gosset and then the toe. So that is uh, what a Dutch heel is doing. And I'm going to talk about my socks design that is using the Dutch heel method. 
So this uh, seedling sock, uh, I designed this pattern because we we are called the seedling stitch. So I want to make some um, make some motif with the seedling, and I designed this with a big seedling and a small seedling, the big seedling and small seedling, and um. Uh, and I'm trying to make this more size inclusive by uh, adapting the size from 35 European size up to 43 European sizes and I might be uh, I, I might need some testing for the patterns in the coming weeks um, I think I will maybe I will I will leave uh, like a form thing in the description and if you're interested in testing uh, test knitting these socks uh, you can um, you can fill in the form and uh, this sock is made with um, the sadness garn sisu yarn of three colors I have a green color a yellow color and the brown color, the yarn, yarn labels, and they are socks yarn with eighty percent wool and twenty percent nylon, and they're they have some really vibrant, nice colors which I like a lot. And my gauge is, uh, I use the two point five millimeter needle and my gauge was 27 stitches per 10 centimeters and to form this let's talk about the heel construction so this is made with the Dutch heel and just to compare with this origami I had so remember you first have the heel flap and then a smaller heel turn and you can see that exactly here so this brown the brown part is the the heel flap and the heel turn and this part with the structure knitting so I knit it with uh, one one row of knit pearl knit pearl rib and the other row is just knit and and then alternating to form this structure knitting for the heel flap and I I find if you can use some structure knitting for your heel flap, it can strengthen the socks a little bit because there's a lot of friction around the bottom of your foot and the heel of your foot. So it's it's a uh, and it's also just looks cute. So here 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 that is the rectangle heel flap, and then there is a smaller rectangle where I just knitted with the pure stocking stitch. This is the smaller rectangle that is connected with part of the bigger rectangle heel flap using the knit two together or uh, SSK a decreasing technique. And then you can form this, let me put my hand here. Then you can form this boxy kind of heel shape. And after that, you will do the gosset decrease, which is this part. And you can see this line. And this line is actually where we're doing the decrease. And if I pull up my origami, and that, that line is just this line here. And on the bottom of your foot, you should see a trapezoidal uh, shape. And I can show you what is going on here. Let's see. So let's see half of the trapezoid. So this part is just the de gosset decrease of the bottom of your foot. And this forms a nice decreasing shape in the gosset of the sock. So that is the Dutch heel. And one uh, advantage of the Dutch heel, so for one thing, it is the easiest to make. Um, you just knit two rectangle shape as well as doing some uh, decreasing. Uh, so it is the easiest 
arguably the easiest heel construction among all the other methods. And another thing I like about it is uh, it it forms uh, it forms a very spacious uh, instep. So if you have a higher foot, if the <laughs> if this uh, is higher, so for my foot, my foot is kind of 3D and a little bit tall and rather than flat. And I find having more space around here uh, is better, is a better fitting for me. And on the other hand, if your foot is rather flat, maybe using a different heel construction will be, will fit your foot better. And I can give you a few more options of the heel constructions. Another building block for the heel is the French heel. And the Sunday socks by Badit Knit uh, uses this French heel construction. But before looking at the socks, let's look at my origami first. So this is the, or the origami for a French heel. Um, and I'll just put the Dutch heel by the side and you can immediately see the difference. Uh, so let's not look at the gosset decrease because the gosset decrease is the same for the two patterns. So the only difference between the Dutch heel and the French heel is this heel turn. So both the French heel and the Dutch heel, they uh, first knit a heel flap uh, using half of your stitches. So this, this is the heel flap for the French heel. And this is the heel flap for the Dutch heel. They are exactly the same. And for the French heel, you are going to uh, knit a trap, like a, a reverse trapezoidal, uh, trapezoid shape for the heel turn. Whereas in your Dutch heel, you knit a smaller rectangle. So that for the Dutch heel, when you collapse them, it will form a box shape in the heel. But for the French heel, it will form uh, like a rounder with, it will form like this shape. So it will um, fit the curve of your heel better, but you will need a little bit more complicated technique to do it, but it's not too much complicated. It's only a little bit more complicated where, uh, so that you can form uh, this shape here. And the gosset decrease part is exactly the same uh, by doing some decreasing stitches and knitting in the round. And let's look at a uh, result here. These are my Sunday socks by a uh, design by Bedit Knit. And the wool I use is actually uh, a reused wool. I used to have uh, a cap from Everlane. They have a merino wool cap with this like black and white yarn, but I didn't really like this color for my for me uh, as a hat because my hair is black and uh, with also a black and white uh, cap, it's just too busy for my head. Um, so I decided after I learned to knit, I decided to uh, frog that uh, frog that hat and harvested that the yarn from that hat to make something else. And then I found this, it's just perf the socks would just be a perfect project for me. And this is a DK weight socks. So it's much quicker than the regular socks. And if you are a beginner knitter who just want to try socks, I would recommend this pattern because it's uh, quite easy to make and petite knit. Uh, her instruction is quite clear. And we are talking about the French heel. So 
we can see, maybe let's see this one. We can see what's going on here. So again, you have a rectangle uh, heel flap. So this is the heel flap. And for the heel turn, this it's hard to see because now uh, you have collapsed all the flaps together. So basically this part, <laughs> this part is the crapzoid in this heel turn. And if I collapse that, so this part will be the heel turn. And we can compare one of the French heel sock with my Dutch heel sock and you can see so here uh, the French heel forms a curve at the heel whereas uh, a Dutch heel will kind of just turn like a 90 degree angle and if you compare the space for your instep this is how much the French heel has for the instep, but this is how much the Dutch heel has for the instep. So uh, you can see if I overlap them, I knitted them with the same size basically. And here there's a little bit more fabric here with the Dutch heel. So if, you're, uh, if your foot has a taller uh, in step at this part, maybe the Dutch heel will fit you better. But if you have a rather flatter heel, you might like the French heel better. And actually, uh, for I harvested the sock, I harvested the yarn from my hat for this sock, but it wasn't enough. So I knitted perhaps one and half, one and a quarter sock up to here. Then I don't have this hat yarn anymore. Uh, but luckily I had my grandma's yarn, which is this gray white color and kind of blend in with this black and white uh, Everlane hat yarn and I knitted the rest of socks with that um, But there was a sad story about this sock because this is 100% wool yarn they are not strengthened by nylon like other plastic fibers so it's not perfect for like heavy duty socks and you can already see that the heel part the fabric is getting thinner perhaps especially this one and i i just feel that if i if i wear it a couple more times uh the heel will just have a hole there and it's just kind of heartbreaking to see one of your hand knitted items have a hole. I think there will be some methods to mend it, to fix it. Like maybe I could pick some stitches around it and knit some newer flap with some um, like some, some socks yarn with uh, nylon in them to strengthen the fiber um, so it's just it's just some lessons learned so if if you want to knit a sock then maybe you would want to either choose the super rustic woolen yarn with the strengthened fibers or you could use some socks yarn with some nylon in it so that it gets a bit more stretchy and won't just wear out like this easily um, when you just wear it a few times. I actually wear them as uh, indoor slippers kind of because they are quite thick and if I wear this I won't be able to wear my shoes. It, 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 I won't fit, fit in my shoes anymore. Um, but it's a it's a nice cute design with you know with some ribs, so it's still a five star pattern, and I would recommend that. There's one more heel method, that is the short row heel, and the ruffle socks that I knitted from Petit Knit is exactly with this uh, short row method, 
and if I can show you here and to do a short row heel essentially what you do is you are adding some fabric in your tube shape but with the short row you kind of just make like a dome and a bubble shape or in your fabric and this dome shape will form your heel so the advantage of a short row heel it's is that it it doesn't look like a separate part so for for my dutch heel it you you can see there is a separate heel flap and it's just a separate part from the whole socks but uh, with a short row heel it just uh, blends in with the whole sock very well the advantage is that your sock is more like a uniform uh, a unity but the disadvantage i think is it the the space here for the instep is the smallest so you uh, i guess you can form larger heel with by doing a few more short rows but at least for the ruffle socks pattern from petite nate i, I find um the heel uh, the space for the heel isn't very large and for me i have the taller instep and uh, the fitting for the heel part isn't very well uh, that's why i decided to gift my ruffle socks to my parents to my mom and that is the short row heel and that is all the building blocks for the heel for top down sock constructions uh, that is introduced in this book but th there are uh, i'm sure there are more techniques for socks construction but uh, i'm just introducing some general ones here that is also introduced in my japanese sock knitting book and the second difficult part would be the toe and let's talk about some building blocks for the toe one method is called the three or four point toe and i'm going to introduce you to the four point toe which is also used in my seedling sock a four point toe here is my origami uh, so these are knitted in the round but i'm just opening uh, i'm just opening this pattern up um, so below that you're knitting the gossette just in the round round and round 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 but when you are about to shape the toe, you are dividing your stitches into, uh, into four groups. And at each group for the two edges, you are doing the decreases along two sides. So you decrease in, in this group and same, same way in this group, in this group and in this group. And when you are knitting in the round as well as doing the decreases you will form this dome and at the top it will just look at look look like four points hence the name four point toe and it's quite an easy method so at the last there will just be four to eight stitches left and then you will pull the yarn through uh, all the leftover stitches and pull pull that in so this is actually a, a very similar method to a lot of hat knitting when you are knitting a hat and on the top of the hat you need to do decreases and one way of doing the decreases was just to divide the stitches into four groups and doing the decreases evenly to four to form a dome in your hat and then you uh, thread the yarn through all the leftover stitches to form uh, to, 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 to form the end and that is what I did for my sock and it just forms this round tip you, you can consider this as a hat for your toes <laughs> and you can you can see by doing the decreases let's see yeah, by doing, you can see by doing the decreases in four groups, you are forming these uh, like four triangles. And at the last, I just pull the yarn through the top and 
and pull through, pull tightly, and it will form this four-point toe. So that's uh, that's one of the methods for doing for doing the toe. The other popular method is the wedge toe method. So the four-point toe method is the easiest because you don't uh, you don't need to do any special techniques. You just keep decreasing. For the wedge toe, you need an extra technique, which is called uh, the Kitchener stitch. So I'm gonna show you the <laughs> origami for the wedge toe. So for the wedge toe, uh, you are dividing the stitches in two groups. And here, th there just might be one or two stitches and you are and then in the main larger flap, you are decreasing the stitches along the two sides. And same for this group. And when you are uh, knitting in the round and doing this wedge toe, you will form a wedge, hence the name wedge toe. And you will form like this. And at the end, at this part, you will do the Kitchener stitch to uh to st to stitch this part of the uh, wedge toe to this part of the wedge toe together, and this method was used in the ruffle socks that I knitted, and <coughs> I can't show you any picture here, but essentially uh, there are like at the end of the toe there are. 10, I don't remember, maybe 10 stitches left on each side, and then you stitch the two sides of the wedge to make the toe. Um, and f for this wedge toe method, it will form a flatter toe compared to the four point toe. In the four point toe, it sort of form a little dome, but with the wedge toe, it is uh, flatter and perhaps fits your uh, the shape of your foot a little bit better. So we are done with the top down socks construction. So for the toe up and afterthought, I haven't knitted any socks actually with these construction methods. So the, the next part can be a little bit theoretical and I'm aiming to design another socks with the toe up method and another socks with the afterthought method because I, w I want to have this like socks saga kind of thing uh, in, my, in my podcast. And when I have designed the toe up and afterthought socks, maybe I, I can explain to you these methods better. But today I'll just, just for the com completion of this episode, I will quickly walk you through uh, the building blocks for toe up and afterthought. So for the toe up socks, uh, we are knitting from the toe up to the heel and then to the cuff. And obviously we won't have the Dutch heel because it's just not quite possible to like knit reversely the turn and the heel touch the bigger uh, rectangle. But there is the possibility to knit the French heel. And actually they call this French heel the round heel in my book. So when you are knitting top down, you call that the French heel. But when you are knitting this direction up. So you are, instead of doing gosset decreases, you are doing gosset increases to form this shape. And then uh, you are going to knit a trapezoidal shape in this way, and then knit a heel flap in this way, and then you go to the cuff. So essentially that's what this so-called round heel is doing and it is just forming this French heel reversely. Uh, and that's what I understood from the knitting book, but I will be able to explain this better after I have actually knitted a round heel design. And I'm going to do that after I finish with my seedling socks. 
Um, also for the heel, you can do a short row heel um, because it really doesn't matter if you knit this way or knit that way. The short row technique is the same and you can just form this, uh, this shape of the heel. Uh, if you can see here, it's actually symmetric if you see from either side. So the short roll technique for uh, the top, the toe up socks will be exact, exactly the same as top cuff down socks. And for the toe techniques, obviously the three, four point toe won't be possible, but there is this wedge toe method is still possible. So instead of Instead of knitting from this side and doing decreases, you are knitting from this side and doing uh, increases. And instead of doing a Kitchener stitch at last, there are some methods that you can cast on uh, at this edge. And I haven't learned that. It's called Turkish. There's one method called the Turkish cast on and one method called like the number eight shape cast on. I haven't learned how to do them. I can't explain, but there are some methods that you can cast on at this edge and then uh, you do increases and then form this, sh this shape and then you increase until uh, you go to the width of your uh, of your gosset and then you can keep going to do your heel. So that's for toe up socks. And uh, one pros for the toe up socks, I won't say it's easy. I think the, the most, uh, the best advantage for toe up socks uh, is, uh, you, is that you will be able to decide your yarn usage like if you just have a small ball or like a, a medium ball of yarn and you don't know if uh, that's enough for knitting a sock and you don't know how tall your cuff can be if you're you can choose the toe up socks method so and you can do two socks at a time there are methods that you can use the magic loop method to knit two socks together and you when you knit to the cuff and you can just use up all your yarn until uh yeah use up all your yarn and the cuff can be just however long it could be and you cannot do it you cannot do this with the top down top cuff down socks because you can you cannot plan if you would have enough yarn for your toe so uh, the yarn usage will be a good advantage of the toe-up socks. Um, and the cons will just be that it's a little bit more difficult and you need to learn special cast-on techniques for the toe uh, to do the toe-up socks. That's what I can think of. And finally, for the afterthought heel, um, you're just going to do the heel at last. And uh, and you can you can use all the top down or toe up method uh, to do the toe. So the only difference is how you construct the heel. For an afterthought heel, uh, the toe you can choose whichever method that I talked about in the previous top down and toe up. Uh, for the toe up, you can use the toe up wedge toe technique. And for the top down, you can use the four point or the wedge toe technique. Um, th th so the this part and that part will remain the same technique with the previous methods. The only difference is the heel. And the short row uh, heel won't be possible for the afterthought because you are knitting the heel at last. Uh, and the French heel and the round heel also won't be possible because you want to do your heel at last so that you don't have to do the French heel or Dutch heel method. And if you just end up with doing the French heel and Dutch heel at last, then th there's no point of doing afterthought. 
And for afterthought heal, the only method that is suggested in the book is the wedge heal. And it is exactly the same construction as the wedge toe. So I'll just pull up my wedge toe origami. So you are just picking up the yarn around the, the heel, uh, the heel hole. So this is your heel hole. And you are just doing the same thing as for your heel toe, uh, the, the heel toe method where you divide your stitches into two groups and decrease them in this way to form an, an extra flap for your heel. So that's the exact same technique as the wedge toe. And that's the afterthought heel. So I would say the pros for the afterthought heel is that it's easy as long as you know how to do the Kitchener stitch for the wedge toe, you know how to do that for the wedge heel, you don't need to learn extra uh, heel techniques, construction techniques. And also some people find the workflow is just, it just flows. You just knit a tube and then you do a wedge heel. So you, it, it's like the heel doesn't break down your sock knitting. For some of the other construction methods, you have to, uh, when you knit to the heel, you have to uh, deal with the heel. But with the afterthought method, you knit the whole tube thing and you finish with doing the heel. And that might, uh, some, some people might find that workflow is easier. But for me, I, I, I don't mind doing the, the heel. I don't think, I don't find doing the heel breaks my workflow. I feel the heel actually brings some interesting aspects to the socks knitting. It keeps my project um, exciting. So yeah, so that's, that's why I, have, I decided not to do the afterthought heel first with my first socks design. And I think that concludes our little lecture about socks. Uh, oh, and about what I'm wearing today, I have run out of hand knitted sweaters and this is just something I bought at the bookstore. And I feel like today we're going to do a very nerdy episode. I hope I don't push you away by my nerdy aspect and I hope uh, this information and all these origami and whiteboards explaining about socks are still useful to you. I'll just have some quick updates about my uh, non-sock uh, non knitting. Um, last week I showed my uh, mittens. These are my self pattern mitten. They are gift knits for my uh, for my friend's birthday. And you ran if you hear it. Happy birthday next week. <laughs> Happy birthday next week. Or hopefully you watch this episode next week. And I have written this pattern out. And uh, Julia from Field House Knit, yeah, Julia from Field House Knit offered to test knit for me, and she's currently using a different uh, color scheme for this. I think she used like pink and also a line of blue, like baby blue here. It's so beautiful, and I look forward for her to finish the projects. And uh, I also thank her for offering me some advices on improving my color charts and improving some of the uh, details of this design. And I think I will be able to release the pattern at the beginning of May uh, before my next episode. And you can, uh, uh, you can follow me on Instagram or check on my Ravelry page uh, for the pattern. If you're interested, uh, it's a fair L design with six colors. There are two darker colors, this burgundy wine color and a navy blue color. And there are four lighter colors, this yellow, uh, this yellow, this uh, gray and this cinnamon and this uh, brownish yellow. And 
uh, I designed this in a way so that you can uh, you can use the six colors, but you can also use a minimum of two colors. You can combine all the darker color or you can combine a few of the lighter colors. You can use two lighter colors, three lighter colors, or up to four lighter colors as I did here. And for the darker colors, you can choose one or two. Uh, I think it's like a stash cleansing project. Um, neither of these yarn are used more than 50 grams. So if you just have some leftover DK weight yarn of uh, some contrasting colors, uh, you can you can make these. Another uh, whip I have is the uh, sail sail vest by Petite Knit. And I haven't knitted much because I have spent so much time on socks. And this is a, a structure knitting vest and I'm knitting this for my mom. And this is just the back piece. It features these uh, like pearl bumps that forms a bigger zigzag shape and uh, some two lines of seed stitch and just alternating. It's not very difficult, not a it's a uh, easy to remember motif and I'm just knitting the back piece and then according to the pattern I will uh, pick up stitches and knit the front panel and then knit some ribbings just around for uh, for the armpit. I believe that's everything I want to show you and just a small announcement. Uh, I opened a Kofi page. Uh, Kofi is just like uh, a Patreon. If you've heard heard of Patreon for like content creators, uh, but it's more flexible. And if you find my uh, content or useful to you, uh, you can support me just by tipping me for a coffee in uh, coffee.com slash seedling stitch. And I would really appreciate uh, any sort of support from you uh, for my designing and also for my uh, Japanese knitting tutorials. Well, as I said, I'm a, I'm a grad student at school. We have to take uh, extra teaching assistant work to cover my tuition and my living expenses in Vancouver which is one of the most expensive cities in the world. And if I can receive some donations from by doing knitting, uh, I don't have to take the teaching assistant jobs, then I can have more time to uh, create more knitting contents. And I, I, and I really enjoy, I really enjoy doing this. I enjoy uh, sharing my knitting projects. And I, f I find that I also really like teaching. Well, I found this, I, I liked teaching mathematics and mechanical engineering, but I find that I'm good at teaching knitting as well, and I really enjoy doing it. So I'd really appreciate your support for me in keep doing more knitting contents. And uh, I'm on Instagram as SD underline Athena. You can find me more active there. And I also post my projects and my designs on Ravelry. And also I'm, uh, I'm opening up a pattern store in the Kofi page as well. Uh, you, can, you can buy my patterns in the Kofi page as well. And today I'm going to play uh, a Bug minuet at the end on my uh, ancient, no, not ancient, my antique piano. It's over 100 years old piano, so the, there might be some problem with the qual sound quality. It's one of the first Bach piece I've learned to play as a child, and I just find it's, uh, I, I find Bach's piece are very academical. Like very uh, logical almost and I find it fits the theme of this episode very well and I hope you will enjoy it and until then uh, I will say hello with my best cat and uh, until then stay safe happy knitting take care of yourself <laughs>